I am Colby Sumner, and this is America, Fog of War. Pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic. Men's souls will be shaken to the violences of... The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender. there thanks for joining us today for another hip pocket history episode uh as always i'm joined by my co-host brett thomas how you doing this morning buddy i'm doing wonderful and i hope you are too i am i'm excited to be here in the yes. studio i'm excited to be talking about uh well really this is this is it this is the last rob for uh pre-war stuff before we we really get into the you know the the all-out combat of total warfare and i say it like pre-war because most of the stuff that we're going to talk about today takes place before the war, but technically this episode will end with the starting of the war. And, uh, of course, we're going to be talking about the Fort Sumter crisis. Yes, um, so, yes, we are. So, you know, just a, just a caveat here before we get started. There's not a lot of military analysis that goes into this uh, because it is this before the war. So we're going to be looking at some things outside of the usual uh, normal stuff that we would look at on these episodes. Okay. We're going to look at some of the political, you know, the political strategies and tactics used by Lincoln. Uh, we're going to look at, you know, a lot of propaganda <laughs> and that's in the media and, and, and how, how much that can affect, uh, what's going on on the world stage. But to start us off, you know, tell us about, uh, tell us about Fort Sumter. Tell us about the Charleston Harbor and, and kind of what's, what's the setting like? What are we, what are we dealing with there? Yeah. So yeah, a lot of moving parts, lots of people bouncing around and things happening. Um, as we lead up to Fort Sumter. So Fort Sumter itself is a, a, a two and a half acre man-made island. It's out there. It's a pentagonal brick fort and it was 90% complete. It had been being built for quite some time, but uh, as South Carolina had seceded, they never finished the other 10% of it. So kind of abandoned. Charleston Harbor itself, uh, not very large, but it is surrounded. The, uh, the Fort Sumter is surrounded by Fort Moultrie, on Sullivan's Island, uh, Castle Pickney, Fort Johnson, and a f you know a few other things that are going to be, they're really abandoned at this time, uh, but they're going to be built up and they're going to be seized very quickly. Okay, so needless to say, if it, to to make sense of all this, if you picture a an inlet, you know, a bay, a big, a, a pretty large one, and you put one island right in the middle, and then all around it, like the you know, the cutout that you've made into the land there for that inlet. You just station a few forts around it, almost almost in like a three-quarter circle. Uh, right. That's that's kind of what you're looking at when it comes to, you know, Fort Sumter and its relationship to the rest of the Charleston Harbor. Um, so real quick, I, I, you know, before we kind of get into everything and the, and the situation that, we that you know, everybody finds themselves in in this time frame, uh, I do want to do a, a little bit of a character introduction here because there, there is – at least for sure, one character that we really won't mention anymore outside of this. He's just kind of, this is what he's known for throughout the war. Um, but he will be a pretty big role in this story, so we definitely want to introduce him. And then also um, the the military commander for the Confederates as well. We will talk about him again in other episodes, but he's definitely not a, a, an overwhelmingly major character in the story of the Civil War. He has his moments, but just to kind of give you a little background, because they're also a little... Uh, intertwined the the history of these two gentlemen. So the first one, Major Robert Anderson, he's going to be the the you know the U.S. Army major that is in charge of the U.S. garrison there in Charleston Harbor. And at the time of you know at the time of his assignment to that role, he's going to be 55 years old, <clears throat> and he's one of the uh, in this time frame he is one of the people that 
everybody, at least in the North, are, are have their eyes on and are nervous about because he's actually a Kentuckian. He's a, he's a Southerner, and he is a former slave owner. So he, he does obviously share some kind of sympathies with the Southern cause there. Um, but that being said, he's also been in the U.S. Army now at this point, I think for something like 35 years, something crazy. He's been in a long time. And, and to give you an idea of how long he's been in, he's a veteran of the Black Hawk, the Second Seminole, and the Mexican Wars. Uh, and the Mexican War is just how they would refer to the Mexican-American War back then. Um, I've already slipped up on it so much, so I'm just going to commit to going. Uh, if, if I say Mexican War, I mean Mexican-American War. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, he feels his loyalties uh, are more so to the you know the flag and the uniform that he's served for, for more than half of his life. What an interesting um, career, I right? would say. It and, is. And, and now you have to make this decision, this choice. Well, and also it's one of the things that I really love, like, it's one of those things that you see in, in specifically only in the Civil War where, you know, these guys have to make this kind of deep moral decision. And I love, like, like George Thomas is another one. I love that. He's a Virginian, and he's like, nah, man, I'm staying up here. I'm going to fight for the North, you know? Like, that's that takes a lot of, like, fortitude because your whole, you know, you, everything you know from your childhood and upbringing is probably going to fall on the other side of that fence. You know what I mean? Anyways, needless to say, to get back on topic here, um, he had a long, he had a very long career with the military, the U.S. Army, and uh, and he decides to stay with them. He's even at at other points in his life, he's even been a um, uh, an instructor at West Point because he is one of the top artillery officers in in the U.S. Army in this time period. Um, so that's that's who's going to be in charge of our U.S. forces, Major Robert Anderson. Now, the commanding officer for the Confederate side of things. And that's at this point, they're going to be considered militia. They don't, the Confederates won't have like a standing army yet. Um, but that'll be a man by the name of, uh, general Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard. And, uh, he, he obviously has some, some French ancestral heritage there. Well said, Sammy. <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> um, from now on, we're just going to refer to him as PGT Beauregard. Um, but he's uh, 42 years old at the time. He's assigned to command the Confederate forces there in Charleston Harbor. He's a Louisianan, so that's where that that, that French name comes into play, I think. And uh, he also is considered to be a um, a very prominent military mind at the time. You know, he's he is too a veteran of the Mexican War. Um, he even had just just before this obtained uh, an appointment as the superintendent to um, to uh, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And get this, this is kind of interesting because just like, just like how everybody was worried about, you know, Anderson, Major Anderson, the U.S. commander, uh, and his sympathies to the Southern cause and would he, you know, is he going to swap, swap sides on us or whatever? Well, Beauregard takes this job as superintendent of West Point, holds it for five days and then resigns when Louisiana secedes from the Union. <laughs> yeah, so. they probably thought uh, anybody around him involved, uh, hey, he's promoted, he's going to stay, we're right, going to keep right. him. We and, got him. Uh, no, 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 you didn't. He's out. He's out. Five days, five days on the job, and he's done with it. But, uh, but needless to say, that's just to give you a little bit of background on the two characters. Uh, Tommy, why don't you, why don't you let us know about our our U.S. Garrison there in Charleston Harbor, and then kind of fill us in on the situation they're looking at. The U.S. Garrison is actually at this time not at Fort Sumter. They're going to be in Fort Moultrie prior to this. So they're approximately eighty men. These are two companies from the First U.S. Artillery Brigade, Company E and Company H. It's consisting of just a few officers from the Corps of Engineers, a military band, which we'll hear from later, a non-combatant workman, and Anderson has uh, instructions to stay here. So going off of that situation is that Fort Sumter is one of only a few federal forts still in the south that are under control of the U.S. government. Right. And it's surrounded by, you know— A few still, other ones. Yeah, a, few a few other, other ones. ones. Now, to, ta to tap on that a little bit, just to kind of, like, you know, if 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 you haven't listened to the narrative shows and you're not really up to up to speed on on what's happening, you know, as these as these states are seceding, um, they're scooping up all these these federal forts, federal armories, and uh, there's only like like Tommy said, there's only a handful left. Actually, there's there's Fort Pickens in Florida. Um, there's a, there's two other forts down near Florida. I think one's in Key West, and there's another one somewhere in Florida. There's one I believe on the peninsula of Virginia. And then Fort Sumter, and that's it. That's it. That's all they got. Um, every, everywhere else, you know, especially considering that the men, you know, the men occupying those forts are most likely from the south themselves <laughs> in all yeah. those other places. They, it wasn't like there was a lot of fighting taking over these positions either. It was just one day they had the American flag up, 
The next day they had their state flag up. Yep. Um, you know, as, as simple as that. But it, but at the time, people in the north are watching as these states secede. Southern southern states are doing this, taking these forts. They're seceding. They're doing all this stuff, and it seems as though no one's trying to stop them at all. No, right? and they, they don't. They really can't because this is their land, and they're establishing. They're seceding. They're establishing their own government and right. and taking over these forts. So what happens is is it leaves Anderson and his men completely isolated behind enemy lines. And he doesn't have much of anything uh, in in terms of supplies or high ground or anything of that nature. So, um, yeah, armories, everything around him is starting to be taken, and here they are. Mm. And, you know, considering all of that, the big thing that Anderson has on his mind above all else is he he wants to be the of the one to avoid starting a war. Like he doesn't want to be the one known for getting the United States into a civil war. Um, and he also doesn't want to allow his men to get captured either. But his problem being there at Fort Moultrie is that Fort Moultrie is in quite a state of disrepair. Um, it's been neglected for a number of years, and yep. uh, you know a lot of the defenses are inadequate to say the least they're really kind of just like sand dunes overgrown with whatever right and and one of the major problems with moultrie is is that uh the land surrounding it actually rises higher than the walls of the fort and you know it doesn't take a genius to know that that's not what you want i mean that's literally being a fish in a barrel um so anderson this whole time has been requesting and requesting and requesting hey can i move my men to fort sumter can i move my men to fort sumter and he he keeps getting the runaround a little bit. Like they, they keep telling him he has to stay where he is. He has to stay where he is, uh, because at the same time, in in the in, in the administration for the United States government at the time is President Buchanan, and he's not had a very good political track record up to this point. Um, he only has a little bit of time left, and I'm almost 100 percent positive the only thing on his mind is please please let me get out of this job without getting us into a war like that's the only thing he wants to accomplish and so between the north and the south there's like this weird understanding where as long as you don't do anything that seems aggressive we won't attack you right like but what do they mean by that because there's so many things that can be perceived as aggressive like for instance moving to fort sumter right you see it seen as an act of aggression well Anderson keeps getting told no, keeps getting told no, and then eventually, now I, I saw, and, and I, the only reason I have a, a hesitancy on this is just solely because it's it's an account of uh, oral orders, not written orders, in a time where it seems like written orders were used for everything. But Anderson, there's it, it's said that Anderson got verbal orders from uh, an a officer named Don Carlos Buell in the United States Army, and his orders were that he could go ahead and move to Fort Sumter. Now, that being said, any written correspondence up to that point hasn't said that. But whatever the case is, whether Anderson decided to do it on his own accord or whether he did get orders from Buell to move, uh, he decides he's going to move his guys to Fort Sumter, especially because, you know, the moment South Carolina secedes, uh, things are getting real down there. Things are getting serious. So they're going to they're gonna move, but they're going to do it at nighttime. And this is in the mid-19th century. Night ops, you're moving an entire base through enemy territory to an island. <laughs> <laughs> Any tell, movement at tell, nighttime. I mean, dude, fill us in on this. What did you find about this? Because this is this this is the most fascinating part of this whole thing to me. Going off of Anderson receiving verbal orders, whether written or verbal, he he's still going to take these orders, and and say this is my post, and he's not going to leave until he's properly relieved, and right. it makes sense, and, right. it, and that's it's still true to this day. So, but like you said, out of nowhere, he gets this information and he got, he brings it to this uh, Abner Doubleday and says out of nowhere um, captain in 20 minutes you will leave this fort with your company for Fort Sumter that's crazy so one moment we're staying here because this is where we're supposed to be to the next it, the sun's going to be setting and all of this stuff all this men all this gear right, everything right. to and the fort this, so this is kind of cool for so many reasons Abner Doubleday uh, at this point in time, is obviously he's he's a captain. He's he's not really any man of note in the military. But by the end of this war, he's going to be a corps commander in the Army of the Potomac. It's just kind of cool to see him at a, a, a much junior grade than what he ends up at, uh, hooking and jabbing with his artillery company. You know, like I, that's so cool to me. But let's unpack this a little bit. Yeah, uh, he's he's 
he gets approached. Sun's getting ready to go down. Yo, you got 20 minutes to move. Now, for anybody thinking about joining the military, uh, that's pretty normal, right? To, to get told, hey, you've got X amount of time to be here and you got you to do it now. And, and your time windows usually aren't that long. Um, because you learn when you're in the military how to move with a sense of urgency. Like very rarely have I seen people in a civilian setting move with the same kind of urgency that you see in the military. And you know what I mean? It's everything, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When it's time to go, it's time to go. Boom. Like it, we're doing this now. Also, it, everything you own is on your body. What the crazy part is though, is that anytime for the most part, I've had a movement like that. And I would imagine the same is true for you. It's usually in a training setting or it's usually in, you know, somewhere in a gar- like in a garrison environment and not in enemy territory, right? Like he, like I've never been told, hey, in 20 minutes, you know, pack the fob up, we're moving, and we're going to move at nighttime, no NVGs, <laughs> nah. and uh, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to scoot through this heavily, heavily occupied enemy territory, and we're going to do it on rowboats. <laughs> <laughs> on rowboats. <laughs> but needless to say, that's not the only crazy part about this, because... Uh, in this time frame, you also see things like this. Abner Doubleday, doesn't he have his wife with him? He does. And what's interesting, too, is because even though it's not wartime, there is a lot going on. So in this case, you're talking about making a movement stateside or training, whatever. You do it. It's it's training. But I can only imagine the excitement in these moments where it's like we have to do this. So, And it had to be somewhat exciting because he tells his wife, uh, that there, there may be fighting. So uh, get out of here, hide behind these sand hills, be safe. So he knows. Everybody knows something's going on. So I, th- I think that sense of urgency and excitement just would move through everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, and, really get you well, going. Well, also think, think, too, though, he's got to be very, you know, he doesn't want to take her to Fort Sumter because he knows that you know, the things are probably going to happen out there. But he has to be nervous about just sending her off. Now, I will say this, though. The way he writes it in that, in that whether it's a journal entry or a memoir or whatever the case, you know, wherever you had those those quotes from, the way he writes it, it makes it sound very comical. I'm, I'm not going to lie because I, I'm pretty sure he says something along the lines of he throws her luggage through the through the sally port and then he put her through after it. Like he just throws her through the sally port and like, all right, go on, right. <laughs> go, go hide. <laughs> Go on into the darkness yourself, right? It's just wild. It's just wild. So anyways, keep us moving here because we haven't yep. actually even started the movement yet, and this is the fascinating part to me. So from uh, f- to get there, there's a small town of Moultrieville there, and he gets the men moving, and you think quarter of a mile, small town, they got to get to the, the embarkation point where these boats that the workmen had been previously using are now kind of stashed, like hidden away there right. and ready to go, but... It's in it's enemy territory, and like you've been saying this whole time, like you, we've been talking about tension being high and stuff, but people are very enthusiastic <laughs> about secession in South Carolina at this point in time, and uh, and they know all too well that that U.S. garrison is there, and they want to get them out. Yeah. You know, they want they are they are they are they are very much paying attention to that. So a quarter of a mile can seem like a million miles at this point because you have your gear, water, ammunition. Everything and anything that you could ever imagine has got to get into these rowboats, and you got to get there. So they load up, and they head straight for Fort Sumter. Now, this is the interesting part. Sorry to cut you off, but I didn't actually mention this earlier. When militia and and all these volunteers start showing up into Charleston Harbor in in the days preceding this, one thing that does start happening is the militia there start to use boats to patrol the water between Fort Moultrie and Fort Sumter. So just so everybody's aware, not only did they have to make it past, you know, very watchful eyes on their land movement to, to their boats, but now that they're in the boats, they got to watch out for, you know, patrolling Confederate vessels trying to catch them. And, uh, and that's exactly what happens almost, right? Yeah. Like they, 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 they get into some trouble, don't they? Yeah. So this is from Abner Doubleday. He says, quote, soon I saw the lights of the secession guard boat coming down on us. I told the men to take off their coats and cover up their muskets, and I threw my own coat open to conceal my buttons. I wished to give the impression that it was an officer in charge of laborers. The guard ship stopped its paddles and inspected us in the gathering darkness, but concluded we were all right and passed on. My party was the first to reach Fort Sumter, end quote. That's so crazy, Talk man. about a close call. And something else I think about with this you know, tensions are gathering and they have patrol boats out there. But at the same time, it kind of seems like face to face, they're still, you know, Americans, they're still neighbors and still 
you know, men. And so it's almost as if like they were they were on high alert, but not really on high alert. Like the war mentality hadn't really kicked in yet. It was yeah, still that's... kind of like, oh, we're just kind of playing right now. Sure, you guys I, can pass. I almost have, see, I, I, find that, I find that take on it really interesting. And I can see that being the case, but I almost have the opposite take on it. I, I get the vibe that, uh, first off, I think it's hysterical that Abner Doubleday not only is a, you know, a, a kick butt company, you know, artillery company commander, and he's moving his guys and hooking and jabbing, but he's also like half Jason Bourne, right? He's <laughs> just getting his espionage on real hard and, uh, you know, take, you know, take, take your coats off, cover this up. And, and, right. and I almost see him actually fooling the, the, the guys patrolling, um, because I don't know, that's just, that's just the, from from what I get in my gut feeling, I have no other reason than that. But I feel like he's he actually you know he fools them, and uh, part of me thinks I wonder if he you know I wonder if he threw on a, a, a southern accent to to to, to do this. I, or... I wouldn't doubt it because it's uh, he had said I had read something that he had been there for two to three years stationed in in the uh, in the Bay Area there. Right. So maybe he did. Maybe I don't know, man. But that it's it's nuts to me that that movement to Fort Sumter is really just something else. I wish we had video footage of it, or at least some kind of verbal like narrative given by Aber, Abner Doubleday on a on on a setting like this where we could really get the nitty gritty from the from the horse's mouth directly. I bet that was a very exciting uh, movement to Fort Sumter. Needless to say, they make it and they you know they they get set up and. One thing that right off the bat they're going to have a problem with, though, is supplies. Um, they can only carry so much, and they don't know how long they're going to be there without being resupplied or reinforced. And now they literally are cut off from everything. They're in the middle of the water uh, on their own man-made island. So nothing's nothing's getting in or out to them. So that being said... Including word, in, including letters. Including word. I think occasionally they're able to get things in and out, but... But truthfully, I, I you know I, I don't really know that. Like there'll be times in this story where it talks about Anderson getting a letter to somebody. I don't really know how that's how that's happening. And that's honestly we didn't we probably didn't delve deep enough into the research to find that. I'm sure that's out there. Um, so if anybody knows, you know, make sure you let us know. But well, he definitely gets correspondence from enemy forces. Yeah, he definitely that's does. That's no problem. He definitely does. But you know, needless to say, uh, the biggest thing on the minds of of Major Anderson and you know, people in the U.S. government at this point, besides, you know, avoiding a war, is the supply situation on Fort Sumter. Are you thinking about starting your own podcast or YouTube channel, but find yourself in need of things like a logo, animation for your videos, or digital marketing materials? If so, Colby and I recommend using Fiverr. Fiverr bills itself as the world's largest digital services marketplace with over 11 million users in 190 countries. With Fiverr, you can find anything you need when it comes to graphics and design, digital marketing, writing and translation, video and animation, music and audio, programming and tech, business, and trending data. A whole world of freelance talent at your fingertips. Fiverr gives you quality work done quickly and at prices that work for every budget. And for your peace of mind, when commissioning one of their freelancers, you get protected payment every time meaning you won't pay for something until you approve the work, so you never have to worry that your money is going to waste. With Fiverr, you also enjoy 24-7 support. Visit AmericaFogOfWar.com and follow the link Shop Fiverr, located in the menu at the top of the home page, and find the right solution for you today. That move to Fort Sumter is going to do a few things. First off, it's going to piss the Confederates off. They're going to see that as a major breach of trust um, in good faith, and they're going to view it as a hostile act of aggression. It, you know, they have to be kind of talked down off this ledge. I mean, to the point that the, the governor of South Carolina demands, uh, after this happens, he, he demands uh, Major Anderson move his guys back to Fort Moultrie, and Anderson's like, no. No chance. <laughs> Not doing that. And, it, and in the North, it's going gonna, it's gonna to strengthen, you know, hope and belief in you know, the power of a union, right, and, and kind of really reinforce the cause on the Northern side, which is preserving the union at this point. So that being said, Buchanan, even though he doesn't want to do anything and he doesn't want to risk causing a war, he finds himself in the position where he needs to do something. He's got a little bit of momentum now. He's got the people behind him a little bit, and honestly, probably for the first time in a while. <laughs> and uh, right. he decides he's going to try to resupply Fort Sumter. And I'm going to skip through this pretty quickly because th this isn't a major part of, of the, the, the story we want to look at. Um, 
but it is usually a pretty big part of the Fort Sumter story in general. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into it slightly. A ship named the Star of the West is going to be chartered into military service, essentially, uh, and used as the resupply vessel. Now, the reason why Buchanan doesn't want to use a military ship is, again, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to push the envelope too much and risk looking aggressive and risk, you know, war starting. So he decides to do it without, a, you know, with a ship that doesn't have any guns, doesn't have any cannons. Um, so the Star of the West leaves New York on January 5th and, uh, and starts making its way to Charleston Harbor. Now, as soon as the ship leaves, uh, the Secretary of War at the time, a man named Joseph Holt, he's going to receive a dispatch from Anderson. So, again, somehow a dispatch got out. Right. Um, and it, that, that dispatch is going to be talking about, you know, secessionists are, are building gun emplacements that are overlooking the main shipping channels in the harbor. Well, obviously... Star of the West is going to get demolished if it tries to go in there. So, you know, Secretary of War is trying frantically to stop the ship, and he can't stop the ship. Uh, and and to make matters even worse, somehow the news of this operation gets leaked to the press. And, of course, the Confederate militia in, in Charleston Harbor are going to see this news, and they're going to be able to prep, prepare for this even more so. Well, on the morning of January 9th, the Star of the West sails right on in, uh, into the into the inlet there, into the harbor, and right off the rip, two cannon shots are going to be fired uh, from a battery on Morris Island. Now, this is one of these things that you only see really in the Civil War. I mean, you see it occasionally in other places, but I think the last time you'll see something like this would be in World War One, and it wouldn't even be American units. It would be like British units where like an entire town goes to war together um, or an entire school, you know? Yeah. Well, in this case, um, the the soldiers of the militia that are firing those cannons from the battery on Morris Island, they're going to be students from the Citadel in Charleston. How and, exciting is it to be them right now? You know, they're probably amped, man. And the, 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 Citadel, the Citadel is still a, a phenomenal military prep academy. Um, I believe that's what they're considered, a prep, a prep academy. I know they're, a mil, they're, they're not one of the major U.S. military academies. It's like a, a level down, but they, they produce some of the you know finest officers the military right. has. But but and, student uh, status is not fun, I'm going to say. Right, right. And these guys now are out there, and they're ripping cannon fire off. Well, and all they've been doing since they've been in school has just been thinking about their opportunity and their first chance and to, to be in a co- you know, combat scenario and how they're going to do, how they're going to act under fire and how they're going to handle themselves. And here they are. They're the ones getting to fire the first two shots. Well, there's going to be a few more cannon shots fired from from various places, and eventually the Star of the West will suffer a minor, you know, a minor hit. It won't be too bad, but it'll be enough to scare the captain half to death. He's going to turn around immediately and head right back out into open waters. This is interesting. The only reason why these shots are not considered the start of the Civil War, like the opening shots of the Civil War, is because Anderson and Fort Sumter never returned fire. And the reason they never returned fire, at least from what I have found here, is he didn't know it was happening. He didn't know anything about the Star of the West. He didn't know that ship was the Star of the West. Uh, he didn't know. He didn't know what the Confederates were firing at. All he knew is that they weren't firing at him. And I don't want to start a war. <laughs> you know, I don't want to start a war, and uh, really can't afford to fire back because uh, what was he going to fire back at? Well, exactly. And also, too, you know that when we talked at the beginning about talking about like the propaganda effort and and ha- like owning the moral high ground. You know, one th- another thing to consider in this era is n- neither side wants to be looked at as the bad guy in the scenario, right? And so on that level, besides the the obvious human sacrifice you're going to have if a war kicks off and you're going to be fighting, you know, you're up until very recently fellow countrymen, you don't want to be perceived as the bad guy in this in this moral situation, like. Um, at the time we're recording this, you know, you have the, all the stuff going on in, in Ukraine with Russia. Well, no one wants to be Russia in that scenario. I mean, like, the, like they are on the world stage. They're looked at like the bad guy. You know what I mean? And even though right. they, you know, even though their military is this, that, and the other, like on the world stage to everybody else, even to a lot of their own people, they're they're the bad guy. And and that's the thing that all these people are trying to avoid. We cannot be the bad guy in this scenario. Um, it's just very interesting. It's a, such a major part of the start to wars. I mean, people will tiptoe around being the bad guy so right, much, you right. know. Um, anyways, needless to say, the star, of the, the star of the West operation was a complete failure. And still, Anderson and his men have not been resupplied or reinforced. And still, uh, South Carolina is not is not backing up at all. They've 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 got a they've got many many men surrounding that place. Many things are heating up very quickly, and. Uh 
like you said, nobody wants to be the bad guy. So do they really want to just, do they want to be prepared for a fight or do they just want to secede and be their own nation? Uh, but in, in any case, the secession is in full swing. Jefferson Davis is inaugurated uh, on February 18th, 1861. And by March 1st, he appoints General P.T. Beauregard in command of all Confederate troops in the vicinity of Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, state officials there, as you had said earlier, they're prepared to take possession possession of Fort Sumter because they had already demanded that it be surrendered previously. Right. So he takes uh, Beauregard uh, was to prepare his forces and await orders to attack the fort. Now, states that had already seceded, this rallies them, unifies the, the, the South under one flag, which in turn draws volunteers. And they're moving here. They're coming. Everybody's coming from multiple states in the area. They're all coming to Charleston, and they're all ready to grab that fort. And they're fortifying everything around the harbor, and it's all kind of pointed at Fort Sumter. Interestingly enough, these forts are all under a mile and a half mm. distance. So it, it's not much, and you, you can clearly you clearly be able to see each other Right, right. Well, you doing you, this. You've been there, and and you've kind of you've stood on Fort Sumter and been able to look across at Fort Johnson and all this stuff and Moultrie and all that. You know, uh, just having grown up on a in a beach town, um, yeah. you know, when you're on the water, you can see a long ways. You know, oh, yeah. you can see a long ways. But I bet they don't look that far away uh, when you're on Fort Sumter and you look over at Fort Johnson. I bet, I bet you can, I bet you can make out people running around and doing their thing and waving like if someone was over there waving at you i bet you'd be able to tell someone was waving absolutely and uh, man that's crazy it's crazy to think about crazy to think about and uh that brings us to the next part of the story and this this is another aspect of warfare that um is going to be unique to this episode we'll do this again with with this character because he's definitely one of the main characters in the story of the u.s civil war but at this point is is the point in our story when president lincoln you know, takes office. He's been elected previously, and, and now he's finally assuming his role as commander-in-chief. And just to give everybody an idea of what he's, you know, coming into, from the time he was elected until the time he steps into office, there's going to be seven states that have seceded in that time frame. And to make matters worse, he's got the Fort Sumter crisis going on, and his hope, at least initially, is to kind of use time to his advantage, play like a waiting game. I read in uh, Team of Rivals, uh, he had this notion of voluntary uh, reconstruction, right? So eventually, like, you know, you, 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 you hang out long enough, the, the fire will burn out and, and people will come to, you know, cooler minds will prevail and they'll come, you might have to make some concessions, but they'll come back into the fold. Well, any hope of that, it goes right out of the window on his first day in office because the minute he steps into the Oval Office on his desk waiting for him is, an, is a dispatch from none other than Major Anderson. And... Uh, he's telling he's telling Lincoln, listen, man, I got four to six weeks, and we're gonna be out of food, like flat out. We're gonna be out of food, uh, so we're gonna have to leave. Um, and making things so much worse for Lincoln too is the fact that he's got so much division in his cabinet and his administration. Okay, for instance, the commanding general of the U.S. Army, Winfield Scott, he's the hero of the, of the Mexican American War, at least at, at this time frame, and he was a very you know. Uh, strategy wise his campaign in mexico was was cutting edge but he's telling lincoln that you know listen if you want to if you want to resupply the fort right now like if you want to reinforce and resupply it you're going to need a large naval fleet and you're going to need 25,000 troops to successfully do that well dude in 1860 there was only just over 16,000 men in the entire u.s army lincoln didn't even have that many men to pull from that is amazing right and that's considering all the forts out west all everything every 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 training position you could have any office position that's everybody in the in the service and he still needs you know another ten thousand to meet that number that that winfield scott's throwing out you for have him. to mobilize the whole nation to get you know more than, imagine more than doubling what our military is now right and you know and, and, and another thing that that's working against lincoln everybody in his cabinet for the most part at least the majority of his cabinet are rivals of his. That's like the whole premise of, of the book Team of Rivals. That's the, the book they made the movie Lincoln off of, or at least a part of, of the book. Okay. Um, and uh, it's a phenomenal book. For anybody that hasn't read it, I highly recommend it. But in that book, you know, she tells the story of Seward. Specifically, Seward is going to be uh, um, Lincoln's Secretary of State, and he flat out thinks he can do the job better than Lincoln. 
and is worried that Lincoln is just going to whiff this whole thing, you know. So secretly, independently, and behind Lincoln's back, um, he's going to establish some back-channel communications with Confederate commissioners. Uh, and he's going to tell them in those communications that, and again, this is on his own authority, not Lincoln's at all. He's going to tell them that Fort Sumter will eventually be yielded to them, right? That, that eventually we're going to let it go. It's going to be y'all's. It'll all be good. And he, he he did, you know, in his mind, he he felt like a gesture like this, something like peace and goodwill would reassure and strengthen unionists and in the upper south and confederate states and all the on and on and on and on but in an effort to force lincoln's hand he's actually going to leak all of this to the press right he's going to tell the press that the confederates already are aware like they they're, they're under the impression you know directly from seward's mouth that they're going to get the fort and uh this is all political warfare dude i mean like strategy to the max this right is a you, thinking game now it's in actually it's 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 a realm that i i find i do find it very interesting but i almost I hesitate to talk about it too much because it's so outside of my typical scope of, of things, um, especially when you're dealing with someone like Lincoln, which we're going to get to here in a second. But don't make any mistakes. Seward was definitely savvy of what he was doing. Obviously, this is this is this would that would piss me off. You know, like if someone someone in my administration was doing that, honestly, I'd probably fire him. Right. But but Lincoln, you know, Lincoln, he 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 allows the he allows himself to cool down he doesn't get extreme he doesn't fire seward he does address it directly but the problems continue because even even on the on the subject of fort sumter everybody in his cabinet is of different opinions on how they should handle it for instance he takes a poll of his cabinet and asks them assuming if it were possible now to provision fort sumter under all circumstances is it wise to do so out of his entire cabinet there's only one person that that said, you know, yes, we, we need to do this. And that's going to be Postmaster General Blair. It, now, Sammy, it is interesting, though, that he does have a, more people that lead one way or the other but in his cabinet, but he does have some diversity in decision-making where it would it's, it could be a good thing to get from multiple different viewpoints right. to see what, what people are feeling like. You know, this initial cabinet had some flaws in it, and, and they, will, they will fix those eventually. But... I think his initial thought on his cabinet was very wise. He's one of the first, I think he is the first president to do that, to pick, you know, to pick rivals to be in your cabinet, not just yes men, essentially. Right. And um, uh, it does pay off in, in, in other, you know, in other areas. But in this part here, you know, for the most part, they're, everybody's brand new to working with each other. They don't know, they don't know, you know, the kind of stuff Lincoln is made of and, and how truly genius he is at what he, what he does at this point yet. And so, Everybody thinks, like I said earlier, they think they can do the job better. If you're a history lover, like Brett and I, then books are probably your guilty pleasure. I don't know about you, but I'm buying my next book usually long before I finish the book I'm reading at the time. Well, over the last few years, I find myself buying the audio version of books more and more. That's because I can listen to more books in a year than I could read in a year. Audiobooks give me the ability to listen at times that reading just isn't an option, when I'm driving or when I'm mowing the lawn, and my favorite, when I'm going to bed. Especially when the narrator has a good voice, it'll knock me right out. If you feel the same way, or if reading isn't your thing, but you think audiobooks might be something you could enjoy, then Brett and I recommend you try Audible Plus. Audible Plus is a brand new, all-you-can-listen membership that offers access to thousands of titles, including a vast array of audiobooks, podcasts, and originals that span all genres, links, and formats. Visit AmericaFogOfWar.com and follow the link Try Audible Plus, located in the menu at the top of the homepage, to get access to your free 30-day trial and stream all the Plus catalog content you want. So Blair's the only one that says yes to this. Well, needless to say, Lincoln decides, all right, listen, I'm going to wait. I'm going to hold off. I'm not going to take any action yet because if the people I assign to give me advice in my cabinet are giving me advice and I don't take it, then what's the point of having assigned them in the first place? Right. Um, but now in the meantime, he does tell a man by the name of Gustavus Fox to start kind of prepping and researching an idea for a resupply reinforced mission that Fox had presented to Lincoln a few days before this. Not too much longer after that, General Scott, again, the commander of the U uh, all U.S. Army forces, is going to recommend that Fort Sumter be abandoned. Um, he's going to base this decision, from what I found, more so on political motivations than like a, from a military perspective. Lincoln's pissed. 
uh, Lincoln Lincoln takes Scott's proposal to his cabinet and shows them all this, shows them the, you know, the political motivations that are within the document itself. And, uh, and they all decide, all right, well, it's time we need to do something to resupply Fort Sumter. So Lincoln comes up with this brilliant idea because, again, the whole point here is to not look like the bad guy. I can't take the first aggressive action. So Lincoln, you know, hires this Gustavus Fox guy to go do this resupply mission. Um, and he's going to write a letter and send it to Jefferson Davis, letting them know, listen, hey, man, I have to resupply those guys with food. We're not going to do anything aggressive. We will not fire any shots. I'm giving you a, a heads up warning on it. So if you shoot at me, <laughs> you're the bad guy. You're the bad guy, right? I have told you all they need to do is eat. We're not moving anybody in. We're not taking anybody out. Just giving them food. That's it. And uh, and it's kind of this this kind of like the uh, you know a you lose I win or I win you lose situation. Like no matter no matter what Jefferson Davis does, he's going to end up losing, right? And you see Lincoln do this time and time again. He's he's the way he handles things is fascinating to me. It is. It's a major shift, I'd say. Needless to say, that's where we're at when things start to really deteriorate because, as I said, Lincoln's going to send word of this to Jefferson Davis, and then what happens, Tommy? And then this news flies even further south. So Jefferson Davis decides that it's now time to demand surrender of the fort, and if they don't surrender, he's going to take it by military force. Now, the crazy part about this is the time restraint. President Davis, he sends Beauregard orders detailing of how to proceed, and he gives them a deadline of April 12th, 1861. The only problem with this is, is it's April 11th. So he's got one day, he receives this message, and he's got one day to negotiate the surrender. So General Beauregard sends a message to Major Anderson, and he tells him, this is your formal demand of surrendering the fort. Uh, so, but interestingly enough, Beauregard at the U.S. Military Academy, he studied under Major Anderson. Oh, that's interesting. Talk about that being like the teacher-student, and then especially in a military relationship, um, how incredibly uncomfortable this has got to be. You're telling your superior, hey, yeah. you're going to surrender or uh Well, uncomfortable or else. and probably sad and, you know, like all, all kind of feelings. I mean, listen, I can't imagine doing that with, you know, uh, Lieutenant Varela. No. Uh, or or um, or anybody, Wenzel or Regal, any, any of those guys. I couldn't imagine having to do that, you know, be in that, find myself in that situation with them. Um, and it's it's definitely unique to this war and this war alone, you know. Like this is a, it's just one of those things that s this sets this war apart, that, that you're going to have to do this time and time again throughout this war. Um, but this is the first one, right? This so this is, there's, you know, you, there's no like, acclimatization at this point you haven't you haven't built up a tolerance to this kind of stuff yet and uh i'm sure it's very 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 weird and very you know in a weird way also sad and i don't know it'd be a weird situation a crazy situation thank god i never have never found myself in it but i love right. thinking about it man it's just ah uh, these, these are those crazy p times in in the human experience that i love to see how people handle it you know right right but nonetheless following orders given to him directly so uh, from So what he exactly says, Beauregard, on the 11th, quote, Sir, the government of the Confederate States has hitherto forborne from any hostile demonstration against Fort Sumter in the hope that the government of the United States would voluntarily evacuate it. The Confederate States can no longer delay assuming actual possession of a fortification commanding the entrance of one of their harbors and necessary to its defense and security. I am ordered by the government of the Confederate States to demand the evacuation of Fort Sumter. All proper facilities will be afforded for the removal of yourself and command, together with company, arms, and property, and all private property, to any post in the United States which you may select. The flag which you have upheld so long with so much fortitude under the most trying circumstances may be saluted by you on taking it down. I am, sir, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Beauregard, Brigadier General, commanding, end quote. How incredible. Yeah, and that's, it's nuts. You know, I love the language these guys use, too. I, the, the you know, very respectfully, your obedient servant. You don't see things like that anymore. It's, oh, it's, it's the highest respect and, it's just, and thought out. It sounds, it's, and it just sounds, it sounds cool, man. It's, they, they wrote well. I love Anderson's response here, though, because what I gather from Anderson, we're going to see here in a little bit, you know, he, he very much knows the situation he's in. And uh, 
and he knows that he, you know, if he runs out of food, he can't allow his men to starve. But at the same time, you know, he's, he's got that, that career long soldier in him, you know, like, like old, just iron horse soldier. And, um, he, he doesn't want to get, he, he's not going to give up what he's been told to hold. And yeah, he's being told to do it now. You got a day. Yeah. So, uh, this is what, this is what Anderson responds. Quote, General, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your communication demanding the evacuation of this fort and to say in reply thereto that it is a demand with which I regret that my sense of honor and my obligations to my government prevent my compliance, thanking you for the fair, manly, and courteous terms proposed and for the high compliment paid me. I am, General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Major Anderson. End quote. So he's holding his ground. He's not, he's, you know... I, I'm not going to surrender that easily, buddy. I gotta, I gotta hold it while I can, and um, mm, crazy because you know up to this point, you know the the, the Alamo has happened. It's not not that long ago that the Alamo was taken place. I mean, long enough ago where there's many people alive in this story probably that weren't around for the Alamo. But I feel like Anderson might have been around <laughs> in that time, yeah. and uh, uh, and then you've also got Thermopylae that that's been looked at by. Every kind of mind, not just military minds, and they for, all read for about centuries. It. Yeah, so you know he knows where he's at, and he knows that if this, if there are, you know, infantry forces essentially foot foot, you know, ground forces that make their way into that fort, um, and they're fighting, he's 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 got to have you know he's he's got to have the knowledge that his likelihood of survival and his men's survival is non-existent. Um, but he says, "Nah, man, I'm staying. I'm staying. We're gonna yeah. fight." And that's a really, I really, I really, I really uh, admire that. Carry us on. All right. So, moving forward, Beauregard, he has these uh, staff officers to him. They're going to be two majors: Major Stephen Lee and Major James Chestnut. They go out there and deliver. When they deliver the first message to Fort Sumter, actually, Major Anderson ends up telling them that even if the Confederate guns don't fire on the fort, that he doesn't have much time. He's got maybe less than a few days of supplies left. So right. this yeah. is what he goes ahead and, and kind of says. Now do you think, what do you think? you think he said that like, you know, hey, guys, listen, this is the, or do you think it was more of an offhanded comment? I wouldn't say offhanded. I would say more like maybe maybe buying time. Like if I said I'm only going to last a few more days, well, maybe maybe the other side will wait them out then. Well, that's interesting. I've actually never thought of that from that angle, and you could be right. That that does, I mean, that would make sense as a tactic there. Um Interesting. That was a great point. I love that, dude. Well, these guys, these these majors, Lee and Chestnut, they come back, and of course, they tell Beauregard, "Hey, he's only. This is what's happening, and this is what he said to us." So, in Beauregard's second letter, he he obviously has heard what was said. He writes Anderson, "Hey, I heard what you said. I know what it means. I'm going to do like my due diligence. I'm going to run this information that you only have a few days left because I believe you." I'm going to run it up to my chain of command and see what they say about it. But if my chain of command says, no, you can't stay till past the 12th, whatever it be, the 15th, he was trying to stay till the 15th. If they don't agree with this, I still have to move forward. Right, right. So I think he's trying to do his best in like, in a sense where, you know, they are, have a relationship or at least an acquaintance right. to each other. So. Yeah, I'll do what I can, but I, I don't know if it ever really turns out that way. Hmm. Crazy, man. Well, Anderson's going to respond to that, and you're right. He, he he gives them the day. You know, he he goes through and tells them, listen, you know, I appreciate the offer. Um, we'll we'll most likely have to evacuate on the 15th by noon. So, the, you know, just a few days past what that deadline is. But it's interesting that you bring up the tactic of just trying to stall, though, because Again, I've never thought about that to this point, and if you look at it through those, you know, through that lens, it's actually pretty brilliant. I mean, that could have that could have been like an idea because he does make the point. The one thing that Anderson says in here is, "I will leave. I won't fire on anybody. You know, uh, as long as I'm not fired on and, and and all that stuff. Just you know, I won't be aggressive. You're not aggressive, and I'll leave on the fifteenth by noon, unless." In the time between now and then, I get word from my government stating otherwise because I'm going to do whatever my government tells me to do or orders me to do. Um, and then, you know, very, very respectfully, your humble and obedient servant sends it back. And what is, uh, what's the, what's the final, you know, consensus? Well, uh, through all this courteousness and uh, 
respectfulness and everything involved in these these communications, it certainly doesn't go that way. So on the 12th, about 3.20 in the morning, I don't know if this is when he wrote it or about 3.20 is when it was delivered, but I got to read this one. Quote, Sir, by authority of Brigadier General Beauregard, commanding the provisional forces of the Confederate States, we have the honor to notify you that he will open the fire of his batteries on Fort Sumter in one hour from this time. We have the honor to be, very respectfully, your obedient servants, James Chestnut, aide-de-camp, Stephen Lee, aide-de-camp, end quote. Now, I don't see his name in there, Beauregard, but I... It mentions him yeah. in the letter that he's going to do this in by one his hour's authority. time. Yeah, by his authority. You know, it's interesting because everything up to this point has been signed by Beauregard, written and signed by Beauregard. I wonder, I wonder why it is that he doesn't sign this one, or, or write there, or apparently write this one. I mean, he, it's obviously him instructing them on what to say, but um, you know, it's it starts out by by the authority of uh, Brigadier General Beauregard. That's kind of a that's kind of a curious. It stands out to me. I don't know if we're just missing some old school military, you know, formality that we right. just are unaware of. Um, but barring that, unless than as long as as long as that isn't the case, um, that really stands out to me. It seems like he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to be the one signing the death warrant for his old mentor. Yeah, he doesn't want to be. But hey, fair warning, pal. right? He's still got to follow through on his orders, but he doesn't want to be the one to have to actually sign it. He'll carry him out. He, he just doesn't want to deliver the, the, the news with his name on it, you know? Maybe so. Do you love America Fog of War and want more of it? If so, Brett and I would love it if you became a member of the America Fog of War Patreon. Visit AmericaFogOfWar.com and follow the link Become a Member located in the menu at the top of the homepage and pick from one of our three membership subscription options. As a member, you can enjoy ad-free early access to all of our free episodes, like this one, as well as gain access to not one, but two extra episodes a month and join either Brett or myself on a monthly Zoom call where you can help us make decisions pertaining to future episodes of America Fog of War, discuss war movies and books, and talk about some of your favorite American battles and campaigns, hip pocket class style. Your membership subscriptions are what enable us to bring you the content you love every month. Help us grow this podcast and become part of the team today at AmericaFogOfWar.com. All right, so let's let's rehit real quick before we get into the actual fighting here. Let's just touch base one more time on you know what the U.S. forces have at their disposal uh, and what Fort Sumter is set up like. Uh, so again, there's 80 guys. We've got two artillery companies uh, there on the you know there in the fort with a few deta- a, a few attachments, a band and, and some workmen and, and that kind of stuff. But military fighting guys, you got roughly 80 of them. And Fort Sumter actually has 60 guns at the time, but. Anderson's only going to be able to employ 21 of them effectively because they're crew surf weapons. And, you know, we need we need a few dudes to run one gun, right? Right, right. Um, another problem they're going to have on Fort Sumter, too, and the reason why they're, conf- you know, they're, they're constricted to the guns they ha- they end up using is it's a, it's a tiered fort. So they're like floors, essentially. There's three floors. Um, the most effective guns in, in this particular engagement would have been found on that top floor, the top tier. But unfortunately, the top tier doesn't have any overhead cover. You know, there's no, there's no, nothing to protect from incoming shells up there, at least shells with a high trajectory or coming mm-hmm. from a higher elevation, which all of the forts surrounding Fort Sumter are going to be from a higher elevation. Higher elevation. Um, and these higher points on the wall like not only is it better for firing but it's also better for seeing where you hit right right and where your adjustments are right and so because of all that he's going to have to put his guys on that bottom tier and that bottom tier you know this fort is designed for counter you know counter naval operations right so if a if a if a a foreign fleet is trying to take over charleston harbor this fort is designed to you know combat and defend against that the one thing you don't have in counter naval artillery of the era is a need for high arcing trajectories. Uh, you know, like you think about someone throwing a football, the difference between throwing a lob pass, you know, where it goes real high in the air and then comes back down to you, and then like a, a bullet pass, right? You know, like a Line straight drive. straight to you. In, in counter naval operations and naval operations, you know, you don't have anything in front of you, so a bullet pass is the way to go, you know? But then you think about, all right, well, 
on ground operations, it's a little bit different of a story because you have many things you usually have to get over and the, 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 like a mortar or anything else, a high arcing trajectory for your artillery round uh, is, is ideal for a lot of scenarios. Real quick, think of some of the things. These guys are artillery guys. They must study all these things like dead space and any t- you know how to yeah. fire into embankments, through For embankments, sure. over embankments. Um, and they're really, see, at that lower level, they're firing out of portholes, the same thing you would see on the side of a ship. Right, it's just- and it's at sea level, right? They're at sea level. So, uh, And one thing that they're going to run into with these guns down the bottom is, is some of the some of the heaviest duty guns are down there, but they don't have the trajectory that they can, you know, where they can high arc it or even get high enough elevation to be able to reach places like Fort Moultrie. You know, the, the most effective cannons for that would have been on top, but again, they got no cover up there. And the cannons that the Confederates have, uh, from my understanding, they are for those high arcing trajectories. But that being said, you've been there. Tell us a little bit about some of the cannons on Fort Sumter and what you kind of... Like I said, this place, it's beautiful. And you take a ferry ride out there. It's about 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And you can see the, the guns in there. And especially these ones on the lower level, which are like kind of like on a small train track. It's like kind of like a, you know, so they can traverse the, the cannon left or right. Um, all that's still there. But something I was told was... There's a bridge, the, the Ravenel Bridge, it spans the Cooper River, and it's to the north of Fort Sumter, northwest, really. And um, that bridge is four miles from Fort Sumter. And the gentleman that was going over this said, these cannons, which are the 100-pounder parrots, they can reach that bridge. And when you're there on Fort Sumter, and you're like, this cannon can reach the bridge. Four miles is a long four way. Four miles is a long way. And then you look across to... Uh, you know Sullivan's Island, Morris Island, any of these surrounding areas, they're only with they're with they're all under half a mile and a half. Right. So that's where this mortar fire and trajectory and would come into place because you know can it shoot four miles straight shot? I don't think sure. so. Yeah, you, yeah. You just gotta arc it up there. There's a little bit of a uh, a point to learn from my guess is it's not always about having the strongest gun. Sometimes it's about having, you know, or, or the, the, the most powerful tool. It's about having the one that's going to work the best. And, and truthfully, you know, in, in a, a normal line company, an infantry line company, it's the hierarchy trajectory stuff that you really want anyways. You know, you will call for fire from artillery and that, you know, not so high arcing trajectory. Um, but the ones that you use most often are going to be things like your mortars and, and stuff like that, 60s and all that, and uh, because they are effective. And 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 um, and nowadays you can do all kind of things, air burst and all that, you know, um, with artillery, which make it a li- you know, it, it it achieves a like or a similar kind of uh, result that as the as the mortars and stuff do. But but that's that's a little further off in the in the future from from where we're at now. Speaking of mortars, though, on uh, Fort Moultrie. They have everything basically the same, a few differences, a few things are different um, in the in the talking about the types of cannons that they had, but they can all easily reach the fort. So, uh, and what they do over the past few weeks is the Confederates, they, they capture everything, fortify everything. They have Fort Moultrie, Fort Johnson, and the small castle uh, Pickney Fort. Um, but what's interesting about it all is they do all this with without any bloodshed. Right. So everything's built, everything's ready to go, taken over. There's no like uh, forceful. I don't think taken over because we're yeah. maybe we're about to see that. But anything else, it's incredible because you know no bloodshed. Now there was a federal arsenal in Charleston. They captured that, and that's interestingly enough as well as twenty thousand weapons. They get new batteries they get everything set up and they have just all the weapons all the arts everything well, ready they, to and rock and roll and that's gonna you know those weapons are gonna go not only you know, they're not only gonna be used in this one engagement but now they've got twenty thousand more weapons that they can they can arm you know new recruits for the southern you know the confederate army that's a lot um, in the coming in the coming months so uh, grab like that twenty thousand weapons that's that's substantial but needless to say man we've we've gone over everything and now here we are at the moment of truth and, uh, and the cannons are going to open fire. And to kind of kick this off, we're going to do something a little unusual. We're going to take a quote from a civilian that was living there in Charleston. This woman is highly, highly quotable and has been quoted many, many times in many things, you know, documentaries and shows and books on the Civil War. 
Uh, her name is Mary Chestnut. She she kept a diary throughout the you know throughout the the length of the war, and it's phenomenal. If 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 you haven't looked at it yourself personally, you'll get some amazing firsthand accounts in there of of the life and times and and what was going on because her husband is actually. Um, one of uh, one of PGT Beauregard's staff officers, one of his aide de camps, that um, Major Chestnut is her husband. Okay. So she she's got the inside scoop on everything that's happening all the time, and she writes phenomenally. Uh, but this is what she has to say when it comes to this point. Quote: I count four St. Michael's bells chime out, and I begin to hope. At half past four, the heavy booming of a cannon. I sprang out of bed and on my knees, prostrate. I prayed as I never prayed before. She continues on a little further on in this diary entry. She says, uh, Certainly fire had begun, the regular roar of the cannon, there it was, and who could tell what each volley accomplished of death and destruction, end quote. You know, she, so, it, it, it ha, listen, I've, one thing I, that stood out to me drastically when we were in Afghanistan especially is when you would be in the wire, you know, you'd be back on base, like inside the wire, um, uh, you, you you have a patrol later that day. You've already done your patrol. You're on a different you know rotate whatever the case is. You're you're inside the wire, and then you hear a, a gunfight outside of the wire, like with some of your guys out there, and um and they sound listen they you I mean you know they sound crazy when you hear them. It's nuts, you, you know. <laughs> there's there's all booms and bang, like all kind of things going on, and and certain ones can get even crazier sounding, you know, depending on how many people are engaged. Right. And you you're just wondering the whole time. Well, crap. What's 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 happening? You know, is that incoming, outgoing fire? Is that like you know? And you get a little attuned to it as the months progress. You can kind of start picking things out. Well, you hear the different weapon systems and, right. and when they employ or when they impact. Right, that's right. It's also interesting to right. listen for. And and uh, but it's nerve wracking because you never know until they get back. Okay, was that a success or was that you know? Do we just get? Do we just have a few you know, like a mass casualty situation? And uh, for someone like Mary Chestnut, I can imagine that the feeling was only you know at least at least equal to that you know if not more so because at least you know for us we're prepared we. We've been, where that's what we're there to do. Right. You know, we we signed up for that, and we've been preparing for a long time. Like our mentality is more in line with that than I think maybe Mary Chestnuts was at the time. But I just thought that quote was kind of interesting. But to get us uh, to get us back over to Fort Sumter and Major Anderson and the rest of the U.S. Garrison, um, those rounds are going to start impacting at around 4:30 a.m. on the 12th, somewhere in there, 4:20, 4:30. Again, uh, we can't stress this enough. The supply situation is critical, even with ammunition. And he has to conserve, and he has to use his ammunition wisely. He has his guys hold off until daylight. You know, this is 4.30 in the morning. The sun's not up. He's going to wait and make sure they can see what they're shooting at before they start dumping shells down range. And they're just getting battered. Right. And and so, you know, I, I have here that they they um, you know, they um report they report for a formation at 6 in the morning, and then they eat breakfast. <laughs> That's awesome. I know. I I, it, you know, but I get it though. You know, if you think of it from the sense of they're looking at themselves like the next Alamo, eating breakfast kind of makes sense. Like, you know, enjoy some food one last time. Or I don't know if that's just what they did before they went in, like, the, hey man, we're not going to shoot until, you know, this time anyways. Might as well go ahead, <laughs> go ahead and eat something. Yeah. I don't know about you. I don't know if I was, if I was under shelling like that, I don't know if I'd be eating. Well, hopefully it wasn't like, like constant shelling like you would had in the First World War where it's just, yeah, it, all the time around the clock. This may be bombardment after bombardment, but it, evidently the fort was holding up pretty well. So I think breakfast was a good idea. Yeah, yeah. At this point, we're only about two and a half hours in, but about seven a.m., uh, Captain Abner Doubleday again is going to fire a fire a shot at the ironclad battery. Just to tell you guys what that means, there's a the Confederates had built this almost on a barge or a, a floating platform. They had put some artillery pieces on there, uh, so a floating battery, essentially. He fires his first shot, and um, he misses. So Captain Doubleday is the first person to fire the first shot in defense of the fort. Yep, he fires it. In, in uh, defense of the Union. Yep, and even though he misses, I, I got to tell you, my first time pulling the trigger overseas was not, <laughs> was not <laughs> the sexiest either, so it's all right, buddy. It's all right, Doubleday. It happens. Um, needless to say, though, the bombardment is going to continue 
obviously past that. And three times that day, uh, the barracks are going to catch on fire there on Fort Sumter. That's a problem. Everything's going to catch on fire. This fort's not designed for, for incoming grounds from above. Again, like we mentioned earlier, this is a counter-naval, like, installation, right? That's yeah, the outside designed of the fort's for, fine. Right. So, like, the walls in the front are going to be, they're going to be just fine, but they have no overhead protection, right? No, no secure roof, essentially. And, uh, you know, the the officers' quarters are going to catch on fire, which is right next to uh, where the powder magazine was. So now, you know, Anderson's got to pull guys off that. He's got to make sure that they're moving powder out of the magazine to a, a secure place so that so it's not blowing up. Um, you know, another thing that they're that they're having to deal with uh, as well is, you know, at the start of this thing, they only had so many gunpowder cartridges, like these bags, essentially. Um, they're starting to run out of them. They need more of them. And so now he's got these workmen, these guys that have been doing construction on Fort Sumter. He's got these guys sewing, right? They're in there sewing under fire <laughs> with uh, with all whatever they can find, whatever kind of cloth, linen, whatever they can find, um, even things from Anderson's personal wardrobe, just to try to make up for these shortages. Just doing the job no and, matter uh, what it takes. And, yeah, and lastly, you know, the, like one, another thing that we have here is that the, eventually even the flag, the flagpole is going to be destroyed. And some, so someone has got to get, you know, get off of what they're doing and go put the flag up as well. It, things, are, things are chaos. I can only imagine that inside that fort it was chaotic to say the least. Yeah, so with the chaos and the, the change in manpower and... So short supplies. Uh, Anderson actually moved. Uh, he he really was only operating now six guns. Originally it was uh, what sixty, and then it was twenty one, and now it's six because he had two two guns facing uh, at Cummins Point, two at Fort Moultrie, and two on Sullivan's Island, and just keeping keeping pace with that. Um, I guess you cannot have fire superiority at this rate. No. And with this amount, you're surrounded, and you don't have enough going out. Um, but anyway. Like you said, the flagpole was destroyed. The colors were quickly raised, and they have these, like, unofficial negotiations. So 34 hours of bombardment. It's a long time, man. That's a long time, and I'm sure you're awake the whole time. Everybody, yeah, you're, it's, not you're not going to miss any part of this. This is So 34 hours go by. All this happens. They start negotiating, and like I said before, no significant damage to the exterior walls interiors damaged but the most incredible thing is that no one's been killed isn't that nuts on on any part of this 34 34 hours happening. of cannons shooting back and forth at each other a lot of cannons shooting back and mm -hmm. forth at each other and no one's dead no one's dead. nuts that's crazy nope uh that was uh i don't know it's just i don't know how that happens but <laughs> you would you would think so but uh anyway there was uh there was surrender. Finally, Anderson, he, he's going to get out. And um, they start on April 14th, about 2 in the afternoon. And uh, they have, they're have they allowed to lower the colors, have a 100-gun salute, everything that they need to do to board ship to get out of there. It's uh, another, going back to that respect thing, we're going to let you go here. Another interesting fact that happened here. So they had, they had the 100 gun salute as they were leaving the fort here and a uh, union soldier, his name was private Daniel Hugh. He's killed by something that happens with one of these cannons. Something goes off wrong, misfires wrong, explodes. I don't know particularly, but it happens and mm -hmm. he's, he's killed in action. He's the first U S death in the American civil war. So then he made it through the, he made it through the fighting 34 hours worth Mm. of fighting and to come at the end of this he loses his life there and he's buried right there on the parade ground so later that afternoon major robert anderson he's taking command of his men and they're exiting the fort and what does he do he plays yankee doodle that that band that we were talking about <laughs> thank the god they, thank god the band was there <laughs> yeah. I, I, to me that's like I see him being like, yeah, I surrendered, but uh, F you guys. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like it is that way because it's more like, yeah, this is a this is the U.S. This is an American song. Right. We're going to play it on our way out, even though we are on our way out. I I I find this whole this whole section of things fascinating because this is this is rare. This is very like, you know, very uh, gentlemanly and a very Napoleonic way to handle yourself on the battlefield the guns salute and march off and they're going back to you know they're going back to new york i think they're not even going to be kept as prisoners of war it's very different than for instance like what you and i would 
would have experienced if we would have been, if we would have had to surrender to the Taliban. You there know, was no no option um, to surrender. Right. So one of those things though that kind of stands out to me, and it's actually it works in the negative favor for for Anderson and his men. But you know, before they're able to get back out to that relief expedition that was had initially been sent to resupply them was now going to be who took them back uh, back home. Um, before they can make it out, they had to wait for the tide to change, right? So this is like the <laughs> afternoon. They get on the boat. So right. they have to sit there all night until morning. And the whole night, you know, you know, old, old Johnny Reb was over there shooting all their cannons. They were singing songs, yelling and cheering. Uh, and and Anderson and his men just had to sit there and listen to it. They Quietly had to listen to it. the celebrations, you know, over their defeat, essentially. Um, so that's got to be a tough one. That would have had to been a tough pill to swallow. But... All that aside, you know, this is only the first interaction of the war. Numbers are very, you know, askewed in one direction. Uh, there's going to be a lot of fighting getting ready to happen. And uh, before we wrap this up, I'm just kind of curious. You got any closing thoughts on this? Yeah, I really just think, so the American Civil War has kicked off, and and what's coming next, immediately next, is just, you see it time and time and again as, as in in the future leading up to now, like there's something happens, there's a major response and, and it's the rally to fight for what you believe in. And, um, but now we have American civil war, newest veterans of the nation are, have already been made. There's been killed in action. It's just incredible history. Now I will say lastly, uh, before you can close on this, I would always recommend visiting the fort. It was beautiful. Like I said, the ferry ride was beautiful. They're, they're speaking to you about what, you know, as you go by, say Castle Pickney, what it looks like and what's left of it, rather. And and it's like a kind of like a tour going out there, and then you get onto the fort and you walk in, and it is just so neat to see everything yeah. in the reality, in the, you know, just what it's like. It, it's beautiful there and highly recommend it because it really makes it, it'll take this moment and what we say about it and what's written about it and you get to just see it for yourself you get to feel it in yeah. a way yeah absolutely listen any of the places we talk about uh, especially in this season um you know just because of where we're located in the country we're able to visit a lot of these places and, and a lot of we sometimes we have to travel a little bit for research and all that stuff so we have to go a little out of our way but i'll tell you um visiting visiting these these parks and these battlefields and, and the things that have been you know kept and preserved for us to see and enjoy it's awesome. It does have a, it, you know, it's not always that third grade uh, field trip vibe when you go. And a lot of these places too, especially Charleston, they're set up for tourism. They've got great places to eat and great places right. to get drinks. And then there's all this history around you and you can be outside. It's it's a good time. I, I thoroughly enjoy it and I highly recommend it as well. And the locals there too, what's interesting is that you, you don't have to be studying history to know that you know, when you live there and you live near something like this, that you know that American blood was spilled here and a battle happened here and everybody's aware of it. Yeah. Well, it, there. you know, I, I live in Gettysburg and I feel like there's just something noticeably special about this place. Just right when you right when you get here, it seems like you, you can tell. And I think it probably has something to do with something to do with that. But, you know, for me uh, to wrap this up, my 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 closing thoughts on this is there's not a really a. a an analytical position I can take from a military perspective on this scenario. You know, Anderson just kind of had the, the odds stacked against him from the beginning. But one thing I will say that I really stood out to me is um, every opportunity Anderson was presented to, like, decide to take the easy road or not to hold his position or this, that, and the other, he first and foremost kept with his duty. He felt his obligations lied to whatever his duty was. Uh, to me, that is, it's that that quality alone is is the make it or break it thing for for a good soldier and an exceptional soldier or a good warrior and, a, and an exceptional one is the one that's willing to do the hard stuff even if the result might be your death because truthfully like we had talked about earlier you know he's thinking i know he had to be thinking about the alamo he had to be thinking about the thermopylae he had to be thinking about all these scenarios where guys were outnumbered so drastically and they all end in everybody dying uh, Especially with all the prior combat experience. Right. You know, it's just, uh, even though he does surrender, he does end up surrendering eventually. I think I think the way he managed his men and handled his men and himself in that situation leading up to that is a very admirable one. But that's what I got for today, man. 
Uh, it was right. a great time talking about the Fort Sumter crisis. Next time when we come back, game's on, dude. War has started, and we're going to start talking about some land battles, and I'm pretty pumped about it. Me too. All right, we'll see you next time, buddy. So long. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, make sure you never miss new ones by subscribing to the show on your podcast app of choice. And if you want to help us out with growing the show and enable us to bring you better content and more of it, then Brett and I ask that you leave us a five-star review. It does a lot in helping us. Brett and I thank you for listening. And until next time, stay frosty.